Forrest Forey Johnson was born in 1925 in Iron Mountain, Michigan. He served in the Pacific during World War II. After the war, he took advantage of the GI Bill attending Northern Michigan University. This was where he met his future wife, Olive Ali Lefebvre. She brought him home to Lefebvre's Island Lake Resort, where they spent their lives working with family on one of the oldest resorts in Vilas County. This interview was conducted October 8, 2019 by Historical Society members Jody Miller and Janelle Cole. We join this video as Jody is inquiring about Forey's children and grandchildren. The formal interview begins about 40 seconds from now. Mike, how many children does Mike have? Mike has, i got to stop and take three. Three? Oh. Two daughters and a son here. Yeah. They're all growing up now. In fact, I became a, what do you call it, a third time around. <laughs> great, great grandfather. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. one of my granddaughters had a son, and they named him Forrest Johnson. Oh. Forrest Johnson Matheson. Oh, how that's nice. So nice. How so nice. I thought that was so cool. And yeah. he's the cutest little guy, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, today is October 8th, 2019, and Jody Miller and myself, Janelle Cole, are here from the Historical Society to interview Forey Johnson, and um, Forey has been a resident of Manitowish Waters for over 70 years. So, Fori, I'll let you start talking about your yourself and any stories um, you might have of your wife's family okay. as well, John Lefebvre. So, um, okay, well, maybe you could start when. Okay, I probably should here. begin by uh, telling the group how honored I am to have you want to discuss my background in life here, and I. I appreciate that, and I'll do my best to add some material that might be helpful to those who wonder about the area as I know it from uh, 70 years of my life here. They've been all wonderful years, I'll start by saying that. Um, to begin with, I came from Iron Mountain, Michigan in the Upper Peninsula, and that is, of course, not very far from here, and uh, went into the service, the military, just at the beginning part of World War II. And my whole senior class, in fact, the boys that were able to be physically fit went in. And that was the beginning of the story of my life where it began to shape up to the coming to this area in, in the Manitowish waters. Uh, after graduation, we were whisked right off into the service and I ended up, uh, I won't bore you with a lot of war stories, but I ended up uh, enlisting in the Navy and I served from 1943 to 45 uh, in the South Pacific on a destroyer. And I remember speaking to the Historical Society one time before where I actually outlined uh, my military career and it was exciting, very dangerous, and I always consider myself so fortunate to uh, have come home. Many, many, as you all know, would uh, not make it and uh, some of them were my very close friends. Um, during the war, I remember, I'll start there because that's what actually in a way led me to Manitowish Waters, believe it or not. I, uh, I came out of the war after having been in battles like Iwo Jima, Okinawa, the Philippines, and actually was honored to be in the surrender ceremony in Tokyo, Japan at the end of World War II. Mm. I never forget how happy it was August 14th uh, when uh, the captain of the destroyer was on announced to the crew the war is over, the Japanese have surrendered. And I thought, my God, I made it, I'm going to be going home. Wow. And I did. And coming home, I kind of was wandering around wondering what I was going to do. And I found out that the country that I had served was offering a full college scholarship uh, at no charge to the veteran, the GI Bill of Rights, if you remember that. <clears throat> and I certainly took advantage of it because I don't think my parents at that time I would have been financially able to have uh, allowed me to attend college, so I did. And that's where I met uh, a beautiful young lady named Ali Lefebvre at Northern Michigan University. Uh, she was actually a senior, almost graduating, and here I was, a 23-year-old veteran coming home, and 
I had met her in uh, the halls of Northern Michigan University. And it was love at first sight, and we got married, and she took me home here to Manitowoc Waters. And uh, that's where, uh, historically, I belong to this community. I've been here now, as uh, Janelle said, for over 70 years. And every one of them have been happy. I think the reason I'm almost 95 years old now uh, is largely because I chose this area. It's a healthy place to live and a good place. And uh, I'm very uh, fortunate, I think, to have lived that long. My wife is still alive, although she's in a nursing home now. But uh, she's 92 years old and she is a Lafave. The Lafave family would really be the center of any discussion I have with you today because uh, they are among the most historical people in this community. Uh, my father-in-law, John Lafave, traces back to his father, who actually under squatter's rights took land on Wisconsin's shores here on the Island Lake, a uh, member of the Manitowish Waters chain, and started a very primitive resort. And uh, three or four generations of Lafaves are still in the pattern of history of uh, the one of the oldest resorts here. Uh, historically, it traces back to 1888 when the Faves had a slogan on the side of their resort truck that said, the Faves on Island Lake since 1888. And that was uh, really a, a number that made other people stop and look at it and wonder, boy, that's a long time. Of course, I wasn't around at any of that time, but I became a part of a family that uh, traditionally have been one of the finest in this whole area. Um, the experiences I had coming here, and by the way, I forgot to mention, I graduated from Northern Michigan University and my wife, Holly, had already finished college, but she stayed with me up there till I finished my bachelor's degree. So I began to look for a teaching job in this area. And I still remember, I thought I really would love to stay in this area. So I began to interview in uh, some of the schools around here, there was a tiny high school in Woodruff and a tiny high school in Minaqua. And uh, I started there, of course, because I was a, a certified in secondary or high school uh, teaching credentials. And uh, I found out that there were not very many jobs at that time. And But I thought, well, I heard there was a little town called Winchester. Maybe I'll try there. And I hate to say this, dear members of Winchester, but I went up there and I looked at the school and I thought, oh my God, no, I don't think so. Uh, it was a one-room school, believe it or not, and here I am fresh out of college. Uh, Winchester had a one-room school. Art LaHaw interviewed me. He was on the board, if you remember historically, yeah. Art LaHaw. Yeah. And uh, he said, you will have all eight classes, all eight grades. I thought, oh my God, all eight grades. <laughs> And they're all one room, you know, that old one room school philosophy. And I thought, well, if that's the only thing, I think I will take it. But because I was certified for elementary as well as secondary school teaching. And um, I got home and I told my wife, Ollie, that I, Testing. Art Laha had made an offer to me. And I remember that, I, if I remember right, I think it even had an outdoor outhouse up there. I think it did. I think it did. Yeah. Oh. And it had a wood oh. stove in the middle. And I thought, I'm going to have to chop wood as well as teach or something like that. And I came home kind of not too happy about the circumstances of that job. But I talked to Ollie about it. And, and as we were discussing it, the phone rang. And the Monaco High School called back and said, we would be glad to take you if you'll take a part-time job. And uh, they said, we don't have any full-time openings. And uh, a man named Mr. Alfonsi interviewed me, and he must have been impressed with me because um, I was on staff there for only the first semester, and he told the board, he said, I'm not going to let that guy get away from us. And so they put me on full-time about midterm there, and that was the beginning of my long 40-year career in teaching in the Lakeland School District area. Uh, interesting enough, too, that Friendly rivals between Woodruff and Minocqua were fun at that time, football, and it was two neighboring towns, small, and it was exciting. But gradually, I watched the school districts change up here a lot. And uh, <clears throat> um, the whole area, as we all know now, uh, slowly merged into one big high school, uh, 
Lakeland Union High School and Woodruff and Monaco with some difficulty losing local control. Some people didn't like it. But uh, eventually they began to realize there would be much better facilities, much better uh, education procedures as far as a high school would go. And so, and of the staff at Minacqua, I don't remember how many were in the old Minacqua High School K-12 school, uh, they selected only me from the staff to go move over to the new high school at Lakeland. I was very honored that they did. But some of the others, for whatever various reasons, weren't interviewed or called in, but I was. And uh, I was happy to get into this big, beautiful new school. That was in 1957 when they actually opened up the school for the first time. And I was there and watched the governor dedicated and entered a beautiful new high school where I spent 40 years of my life. Well, that worked out excellently for me because uh, that meant that I could stay here and uh, uh, live, spend my life here, which I wanted to do by then because I loved the area and I loved the family, the people, and I had a job that turned into a very excellent one. And I stayed there 40 years and I'm very happy that I did. Uh, and of course, with a job like that, teachers are off three months in the summer. and. Uh, I began immediately doing graduate work and earned a master's degree at the University of Wisconsin and uh, kept advancing like that. But I also worked for my father-in-law who owned the Faves Resort on Island Lake. So I had a good taste of what it was for the resort business at that time. And it was hard work, but family oriented. I think every one of my children and my wife and I worked with the family and crowded in. I remember we all moved into what the Faves called their winter house. And they changed the laundry into one room for my Ollie and me. And we had a son, Michael, by then. So the three of us were in the laundry while I was teaching <laughs> in, in the, the winter house. And uh, it was close and wonderful. Great years. It was very, family can't be much closer than to have your son-in-law and his kids all piled into one house. And Uncle Jake was upstairs. Jake Nelson, a very famous guide in this area, by the way, he knew your dad well. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived upstairs, Uncle Jake, a bachelor fishing guide. So, But it was a, a hardworking, wonderful life for me. And uh, between going on with graduate work and working for my father-in-law, I was a busy person 12 months out of the year and uh, enjoyed it all. But. Um, some of the experiences I remember when I first came to the resort, it was very primitive yet the faves. For example, my day, maybe I'd trace what I did in the summer because I was the right-hand man there. First of all, I'd try to welcome the new guests that came in each week on Saturday morning. We'd have a turnover, as we called it, of new people. And uh, my father was a rather shy, strong, talented, generous, wonderful man. And he'd say, Forey, would you please welcome them and show them down to their cottage. I said, be glad to. And so I became sort of the front man, the, <laughs> the, the PR guy, I guess you'd call it. And I would take them down to a cottage and they had nine of them at that time. They ended up with 10 cottages and a big main lodge as the years went on. But uh, the, my day was really something that not having done much work of anything like that, I sure learned in a hurry uh, what it was to be a a resort worker here in Manitowoc Waters on a resort. And the flames, fortunately, were quite busy. They all stayed full. I remember the prices of the cottages. A cottage back when I first came here and after I started there, I think they charged $36 a week for the cottage. Mm -hmm. That included a boat and uh, all facilities in the house. Now you can't get a roll the boat for $36 a day. <laughs> But anyway, that was the beginning, and my day included some of the chores that I know your dad would remember, and uh, 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 it was so varied that I didn't know which end was up half of the time. <laughs> I'd start the morning, my father-in-law, he, he would come, I'd start on working, and my father-in-law had been up since four in the morning, it was about eight when I'd get started, and he'd say, you know, four, he said, you know, I've got a half a day's work, and by the time you wake up, <laughs> And he was right, he did. He'd be up and early and going to bed early, you know. But uh, the cottages at that time uh, were 
clean and John, my father-in-law, had built every one by hand. They were wow. there were no contractors building his cottages. He was the mo one of John Lafay was one of the most talented men I've ever known. He did plumbing, he did wiring, he did the carpentry, and all with primitive tools that he had. And he built actually all ten cottages himself on that resort. Were those housekeeping cottages? Yeah, they were housekeeping cottages. Some of, they started with little one room, one bedroom. Uh, cottages and went to two and then they had a couple that were three bedroom and mm -hmm. as the years went on they added and modernized more and more but there were actually outdoor outhouses on about half of them at that time but Plummy mm -hmm. uh, was he installed himself with his own septic tanks there was no Mike Slate to help us get it started or anyone like that mm -hmm. yeah, he dig, would dig the hole and build a dry well and and hook up the plumbing, and I was out bailing them out about two weeks later because they'd fill up, <laughs> they would fill up so bad. That was one of my jobs. Oh, no. uh, well, the, the tanks that they had dug out for the cottages were maybe, I don't know, I'm in the sewage, but I'll tell the story. <laughs> uh, would hold maybe 300, 400 gallons of cinder block circle with pipes coming from the cottage to it. And I was standing one day on the edge of one, bailing it out by hand into oh. barrels on the back oh. of a truck because it was flowing over oh. onto the road. Oh. And oh. my father not said, Forey, I said, well, I'll get up early so so that uh, I uh, won't bother any of the people, and especially when I opened that thing up. Oh. And I thought, oh, God, we had an old Model B pickup truck, and I had two big 50-gallon barrels on the back, so I went down there, opened the wood top off the tank, <coughs> And you have to picture a, a circle cylinder of a cinder box, that's all, and open uh -huh. gravel at the bottom for the dry well for uh -huh. receiving waste from the cottage. <laughs> I'm uh -huh. laughing because this is a story that I'll never forget. It was about 4.30 in the morning, nice morning on Island Lake, and the sun was just coming up, and I had a five-gallon pail, and I dipped that in, and then stand up and poured it into the barrel, and kept going trying to get it down so it wouldn't be flowing on top of the little dirt road in front of all the cottages. And I was standing on the edge of the top cinder block, and all of a sudden a nice, pretty young lady came walking out of the cottage for a morning walk, and she kind of wrinkled her nose and looked at me, and, and then she came up and and stood there, and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do now? And, and I'm, I put the bucket down, and I'm standing, and this is an honest to God story. And she was saying things, she was kind of coming on a little bit. She said, uh, Forey, she said, um, where's a good place for a, a girl to go around here? Because she was kind of bored with her dad and mother being in the cottage all week. And I was starting to tell her about uh, maybe uh, Kerner's would be a fun place. They have ice cream there. <laughs> and, and as I was standing there, honest to Pete, the cinder block I was standing on gave out. And I, I, I was standing on that cinder block and I dropped down into about seven feet of, of sewage. And, and she, she looked horrified. She put her hands up and said, oh my God. And she took off from me. <laughs> and I climed out. And, uh, and I, I rushed right to the lake and jumped in and tr tried getting myself clean. And the, but the block flipped. I stepped on it, and I was trying to be cool as I thought. And, and when I finally got back up, I, you know, I came back up and I told Ollie the story. She was working in the lodge dining room, and she's listening to this. And she said, "It was a pretty girl you were talking to down there." And I said, "Yeah." And I, I said, "I was so embarrassed." And she said, "You fell in." She said, "I said, yeah." She said, "Good." <laughs> So you might have been enjoying yourself a little too much. <laughs> but look, those stories, but the days at the famous resort, there was always a change of what we had to do. I would start the morning having a breakfast with the guides a little bit, and then I would look, talk to my father on, and almost all the cottages were wood stove heated, and uh, I had to chop wood for that. And uh, father had his own sawmill, he would saw it up and I'd load the little bottle of meat pickup truck and go down and put fresh kindling and wood on the porches of the cottages for their stove for the day. I think they cooked on little uh, fuel or kerosene type stoves, they father had some of those little cooking stoves in there. But I watched it grow from that kind of a primitive beginning to a really first class resort which was American plan, the dining room. The phase finally had, they had a big old one-story main lodge where the meals were served to the American plan guests. 
and Mrs. Lefebvre cooked, and Ollie and uh, neighboring girls around from the area here helped serve in the dining room. And Mrs. Lefebvre's cooking, God bless her. Uh, I told her, if we ever fight, I told Ollie, I'm going home to your mother <laughs> <laughs> because she was one of the best cooks I've ever, ever known. Uh-huh. In fact, I still have her recipe books that Ollie when, made sure she had copies of when uh, uh, Mrs. Lefebvre died. Her name was Saima, and she was a pretty little Finnish lady from the Ironwood area, I believe, and hardworking. And, uh, She'd hum and whistle all the while she worked over a wood stove. She oh, cooked all the meals for the resort on a great big wood range, and I had to keep the wood pile piled high for that. And, and then I would make my route picking up garbage. I'd go down to all ten colleges and put the cans on and go out to, we had our own dump. There was no sanitation at the, like we have our transfer stations mm-hmm. now, but I would go out to our own little dump that my father-in-law had dug out with an old Ford tractor dump the garbage in there, and then hose out the cans and go back down and put them up. And uh, one of the highlights of for the guests was toward evening, that open dump that we had, <laughs> the bear would come in there, three, four at a time, uh, and the guests would all come in there and park their cars. There was an old dirt road there, and it looked like a football game ready to start. <laughs> they would all be sitting there with cameras waiting for them. Sure enough, the bears would come lumbering in and slop around in the garbage for a while. Well, after I got the wooden garbage hauled, then I had been, by that time, the guests were ready to fish, and we had old wooden rowboats, the guides boats, they call them, those old yeah. lap straight boats that were shaped like a peach. And uh, I would clean those, bail them out, and get them ready on the big floating dock, with the big dock actually floating in the water that, as usual, my father-in-law had built on big pine logs, and I'd get those ready for the guests to come out and do their fishing in. And then I would probably go up for a coffee break about then, and then I'd start to cut the lawns. They had, my father law thank goodness, had a big old walk behind El Toro machine that I kept the lawns on the place going, but it was a constant, and he would be out in the shop, he had a wood shop, and John would be out there working all day long, either repairing boats or doing fixing a window that was broken or whatever, and and the days would go on and on like that, seven days a week, and when, when after Labor Day, the resorts would all just close up here. We didn't have snowmobiles and ATVs and skiing and anything, you know, that sometimes kept later on the, mm-hmm. uh, the um, guests coming up. But as the years went on, uh, they kept modernizing the colleges and they became they had to be in order to attract guests and I still remember driving up with the the Faves old Chevrolet sedan and picking up guests at uh, Manitowish when the railroad station was there and I'd sit and talk with I can't remember his name, an old gentleman. I can wood picture sto- him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had a wood stove there and we'd sit and I'd wait for the train to come in and we'd have one or two guests and I had a big placard I hung on the front of the ship that said Lefebvre's and They'd come up and I'd load their luggage and drive them to the resort and those that came in on the train. and But that was rather unusual and I pictured that railroad coming right into Manitowish there and mm-hmm. the old depot was, what's the name of the tavern that's there? Now that was right it, about where it was. Uh, it was right across the street from Lazy Ace. Yeah, Lazy yeah, Ace, that's right, yeah. Chuck's bar yeah, but, at that uh, time. <laughs> I think of the changes that I saw over the years. As the years went on, my father and I finally ended up tearing down the old main lodge and by then they were prospering pretty well with the business and staying full and even into hunting season we had hunters going in until uh, right in, down to November so mm. it was a lot busier for them but he put up what is one of the finest buildings in the area uh, and he had help with that because it's a three-story uh, beautiful stone building over on the hill looking right out at Island Lake, you might have seen it, Jody, the Faves yes. Main Lodge. Yes, oh yeah. And they had five beautiful <laughs> guest rooms upstairs, each one with a modern bath, big dining room that served around 50 people, a downstairs recreation room with pool and and uh, candy bar and beer bar for the kids. And, and it would turn right around to what was really a, the kind of a, a place that would attract a lot of people 
uh, from the city up here for the summer. And we got to know family and we got, people kept coming back and coming back family after family. And then their children would come. I watched mm -hmm. two and three generations of some families come as guests. They liked it so well up here and, and the Lafave family. So, but uh, it was a, it was a good, it is a good life. I'm not using the past tense yet. <laughs> even though I'm almost 95 years old, I, I'm going to stay here for the whole time. I even own land over in the cemetery over here. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a grisly joke, you know. <laughs> but uh, well, like, like the old cowboy says, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> what kind of entertainment was provided? Did, did the, John Lefebvre um, provide certain entertainment at his resort? Not really. He had all the equipment there for them. They had uh, games that they could play. They had the, okay. the game machines downstairs, you know, the kind of pinball, I guess they were at that time. And they had a nice ping pong table down there. And it was, it was kind of early on activity. And they had uh, music if they wanted. They had a jukebox down there, a, a, like a, a old mm -hmm. music machine, and people would gather down there. It had three beautiful fireplaces on all three stories. The lobby was beautiful. In fact, right now, uh, the people who live on the island where Lafayette's Resort first was, out in the middle of Island Lake, mm -hmm. uh, the people that own that now have modernized that out there beautifully. Gensburg, Mr. Gensburg. Mm -hmm. I had lived there for years and became a very close friend of the family. He uh, he uh, was a very wealthy man who actually owned the Riviera in Las Vegas, among other things. And one of the foot sidebars of that, when he opened it up in River, we were very close family friends. And he said, for eight, Dolly to my wife, how would you like to go out to the Riviera and stay for a week at my out uh, he says, I own it, I'll set you up. I said, oh my God, did I hear right? I said, we'd love to, you know. And he, to make that story short, he had us flown to Las Vegas. And uh, and we stayed there in one of the most beautiful suites of rooms in the Riviera, right on the strip in Las Vegas, which was just beginning to boom out there. And saw the slot machines and all the people. And the, in Frank, I'm trying to remember if Frank Sinatra was singing there at that time. And uh, Liberace was playing in the, down in the lobby on the piano, if you remember those names. And yes. Two, but we had the time of our life, two hickeys from up north <laughs> in there. And not only that, when we landed at the airport in, in Las Vegas, uh, I was standing there with my suitcase like a lost orphan in Ollie looking around. And uh, the loudspeaker came out and says, Mr. and Mrs. Forrest Johnson, your limousine is at gate four. And we went over there, there was Mr. Gensburg's private chauffeur in a big Cadillac you know, with a window between. And he said, You're, he said, get in, we'll take you to the Riviera. Mr. and Mrs. Gensburg are waiting to see you. And they were the most gracious, wonderful hosts and hostesses all that week. They stayed right there with us while we were there. And oh, how nice. Eh? Showed us the town, you know, and all that. And it was a trip of a lifetime. That, yeah. I remember that island always being referred to as Ginsburg Island. It's, it's called Ginsburg Island. They bought it from Lefebvre's. Right. So I knew that it had been Lefebvre's, but um, is that, do you know if that was an official name or was that just a name that was adapted, the, the local people adopted? No. After Mr. Ginsburg, it was Lefebvre's Resort on Island Lake and they owned the island. They had a main right. lodge there. In fact, my wife Ollie lived there for three years when she was a little girl, right on that island all year long. And Grandpa Abe Lafay was alive at that time. But as the years went on, of course, the Lafay uh, didn't need that. Uh, it was more work going back and forth to the island as mm -hmm. far as running the resort on the mainland. Wow. And they owned both of them. So he sold it to this Mr. Gensberg who lived there, came up summers for I don't know how many years. All the years I can remember. Right, yeah. And a very gracious, generous, nice mm -hmm. man and woman, Mr. and Mrs. Ginsburg. She'd come up to the dock. We had built a dock for them right on the Faves on shore. And he kept a big Cadillac right in the garage that he also built on the Faves land on shore. It was there year round. He just left it there. And she'd come in in the biggest boat on Island Lake. It was a cabin cruiser of Chris Craft. And she'd come in with a white cap on Mrs. Gensburg, I'm speaking of. White gloves, and she'd pilot that boat into the dock and get in her car and go shopping over at Harry's over there. It was, it was Ty Locker's then, though. Uh, yeah. Ty, Carl Ty Locker owned what it was, Harry's, which is now Hogan's uh, this oh, grocery store, yeah. the only one in the area here. 
but uh, they've been very good years and there's so many stories that sometimes when Jake Scobot and I, my good friend Jake, who lives on the chain here and he passed away some years ago now, but we'd sit and exchange old stories because his dad and mother were pioneers over in the Hazelhurst area and, and uh, we, we'd swap stories. Sometimes we'd shift over to war stories a little bit too because Jake was a 22 year career Navy man. I was in the military only a little over three years during World War II, but Jake had made a career of it and he would, and we'd swap Navy stories and Betty would say, there they go again, those two, she's going to talk war stories again. I'm getting out of here, she'd say, she'd fly out of the kitchen. <laughs> you knew Betty, didn't you, Joey? Very well. Yeah. I loved them both dearly. Oh, my. Yeah, and now Skippy Scrobot, who passed away, sadly, not too long ago, was one of my students and I watched him grow up from a little boy through high school and working with his own carpentry business and then he passed mm -hmm. away and, and then his son Bobby was my student so that was two generations right there of mm -hmm. robots that I taught mm -hmm. and so on but uh, well what kind of changes did you see on the resort while you were um, you worked in the summertime and yeah. eventually they had the openings in the winter because of the snowmobiles. Yeah, uh, um, we didn't ever get to that phase. We shut okay. down definitely, even though snowmobiles were first coming in, uh, right after deer season. We were filled during deer season with hunters. Even the big new main lodge, which by the way, I guess I mentioned that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, modern and every, every room had a bath, its own big bath room and so on. and. Uh, uh, it was American plan. Cy was still mm -hmm. doing the cooking and John and I were still doing the chores and we'd hire local girls, uh, Terry Candlebinder, I don't know if that name rings a bell, but she lived over near Ricky Bakken's place there. Mm -hmm. And she would come and work in the dining room and my wife worked in the dining room and my children worked in the dining room and then Ollie took care of the business end of it also. They had an office there and, and John and I were running around the place managing it. Did you guys do anything for fun, you and John? Pardon? Did you and John do anything for fun? We got later on, so we'd take turns going to Canada and go fishing up in Canada. Ollie and I would go for a nine-day trip, then we'd come home and run the resort. All of us scared to death when I had to run it alone because <laughs> Ollie would end up doing the cooking, my <coughs> wife, and but it went just well, and they were so happy because they had never taken time off for themselves in the flames. It was working, but in the winter, it was the closest you can imagine because everything was done. We'd shut down. We'd have a big party in the main lodge and invite the Frandies and all the neighbors over and Cy would dig out steaks and turkeys and whatever from that were left in the freezer and throw the neighbors a big dinner. Then we'd shut it down. Then John and I would go around and drain all the water in the 10 colleges. We had to drain the pipes because they were not yeah. winterized. And yeah. And in fact, I remember the sad story, uh, in the spring we had to do the reverse, we'd go in and hook him up again and get ready for the summer and I was helping him one spring day later in his life and he was under the crawl space of number three cottage hooking up plumbing, hanging hey, about just enough room to lie down in there and he had a big cardboard sheet from a mattress bag or something and he was working on it and all of a sudden I heard this grunting and groaning under there and I thought, what? Like peered under and I said, are you okay? And he said, no. And he was gasping and I reached in and grabbed his feet and pulled him out. He was having a heart attack. Oh no. And I ran to the cabin and got, I mean to the lodge and got Mrs. Lafave and said, call somebody right away because Pa's having a trouble out there. They got him into the hospital and he survived that. And they lived, both of them passed away way too young though. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ollie's mother passed away in her 60s. Oh. Yeah, she was only about 63 or 4, I think. And he passed away shortly after that when he was in his early 70s. And after they sold the resort for a pound of money that I can't even believe, uh, it almost gave it away, um, and uh, retired and built a home right next to mine where I live on. Uh, they call it Lafave Road now, and I'm so happy they did that. Mm. They named the road that I live on Lafave Road, and there's another trail called Old Abe Lafave Trail mm -hmm. going down to Island Lake, and those are historic marks that went back to when they were the only folks on that whole lake up there. Mm -hmm. So there were John tells me there was an Indian tribe lived on the other end of the lake, 
probably some of the Chippewa people mm -hmm. early on were up at the mouth of the uh, Rice Creek where that comes into Island Lake, for those of you who uh, know of that place. But there were wonderful years and, uh, and uh, as I said, I really think I've lived this long because I chose to stay here. I know if I'd have been in L.A. or New York or somewhere, I, I'd have been in trouble or something. <laughs> Now, did but, John tell you stories when you oh, were working endless, together? Endlessly. About when... If, if you had, if you want to do a whole series of books, I could sit here and tell you. Some of them are so hilarious. And he was always a very gentleman. I don't think I ever heard him swear. And I'd go out in his shop in the winter, and he'd be working on repairing a dozen boats that needed patching. Big wood stove going in there. And he'd start telling me. I remember one time for you when he'd start... And then he'd tell me a story. Some of them were hilarious. He'd talk about some of his brother, uh, Frank Lefebvre, so was kind of a little bit of a, <laughs> I don't know what word to use, but he was a little bit on the shady side. He lived in Wausau, and he was peddling in before Prohibition days. This is one story. He said Frank uh, Lefebvre uh, was making illegal moonshine when the, during the Prohibition, and he would go down to uh, Wausau or the city or one of the places where he could sell it and he'd always hide it in his suitcase. He had to go and come in like a tourist with a big suitcase that was packed with homemade corn liquor. And he said, John said that one day his brother, he, Frank told him the story, he said we went into this hotel lobby, I mean the, the yeah, someplace like a hotel lobby where he's going to sell the moonshine and the suitcase burst open and he said all these bottles of illegal moonshine came out on the floor. <laughs> and we can imagine how embarrassing that must have been, not to say nothing of illegal. <laughs> and then he left and and so on. But one story after the other, some were sad, you know, over the years where things happened that uh, were personal to him. And well, he had a nervous breakdown one time, I remember, and uh, had to be hospitalized for a while just from the pressures of as as the resort grew it was a little more difficult for him to adjust and cope with all of the responsibilities and income tax and everything that was all oh, ancient history yeah. to him yeah. and but he survived it and lived a good life and it was so lovely to stay close all those years he lived now after they retired they lived right next door to me and the story of my home on island lake i've been in it now so uh, about 60 years because we lived with them for about five six years but when i came up here i never forget the showing the generosity of the lafay family he said for a, um are you gonna stay up here do you think i said and if i if you don't throw me out i'll be happy to <laughs> and uh, he said well i'll tell you what pick out any he owned land by the way i would guess almost three-fourths of a mile on island lake can you imagine what that'd be worth today at oh. 2,000 a foot, uh, and but anyway, he said, pick whatever land you want here and frontage whatever and stake it up for a home for you and Ollie. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. And I thought, well, I don't want to be too close to the resort because I thought if they ever did sell it, I wouldn't want to have my home right mm -hmm. there. So I moved down about maybe comparable to three blocks, four blocks where I live now. And then to add to that, he said, just mark what you want. So I remember he gave me 300 and some feet of the most beautiful frontage on Island Lake, and I still own that. And then when I finally picked a site for my home, he built it. And wow. it's a beautiful home. It's wow. still there. I've added to it another wow. uh, wing to it and a bigger garage. And But he built the home by himself. Was I'd get the material in there, and he'd be over there at 4 in the morning putting up a three, four-bedroom home. Bat was bad, and he did all the plumbing, he did the wiring, he built the building, put the roof on it. The only thing uh, that he brought in was old Ernie Reamer from over on Bakken's Road there, a stonemason, and they built a, the most beautiful fireplace I've ever seen in the house for me. And that's so on, and Ollie and I moved in, I think it was 1957, when it was wow. finished, and we moved in and left the winter house, we called it, because we were mm -hmm. moving, uh, we lived, uh, from 1957 to now, no, and that been our home. And he built everything that people do today for uh, something. He doubles the strength on it. He put in more lumber just to make sure nothing would be 
poorly done, and he was a master carpenter mm -hmm. among everything else. He, his, his pet phrase, John Lafay, was, I think I can fix everything from a locomotive to a broken heart, he said. Oh. <laughs> and, he, and I had no doubt about it. He, yeah, they were wonderful years, though, all that. So did he grow up on that island? Yes, yeah. So and that I, was like their some family Some of the funniest home? stories were about his youth was a father that was a giant of a man. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Abe LaFave. Yeah. About 6'6". Six, six. Yeah. And uh, wow. stories about, he'd tell me stories about his dad, whom I never knew, by the way. He was passed on before I got here. But he was a giant of a big French-Canadian guy. And his tales of Abe LaFave's strengths were legendary up here. He, they mm -hmm. said he was so strong. He told stories like they had to keep floating logs around the little island resort out there because the water would wash away the earth. And in the spring, something or other, they had to take these big white pine buffer logs, whole trees, and move them back out into the water so they'd guard the shoreline on the island. And he said the three boys, Frank uh, and John, I forget the other uncle, Anyway, what her job was to get these huge logs, bounce them, get them off the shoreline where they had them up for the winter, back in the water to wow. so on. And he said, my dad came down. We were struggling, three of us, trying to get this pine, a huge white pine, off the shore and into the water as a buffer. And he came down and he started cussing a little in French. He was a big Frenchman. <laughs> and he pushed the boys out of the way. He got down, John tells the story, he got down on one end of the, they weren't about, he said, John said they were around 20 feet long and huge. He got on one end of it, he got a hold of it and he started to bounce it like a stick. And he got all by himself, he just took it up. He was oh, then he, and he said something half French, half English, no, that's the way you're supposed to do it. Around. And the boys, three of them, strong boys, were standing there watching some grandpa do that. And he, there is one story that's a little, it's scary, but he you remember you know where Kerner's Resort is, yes. which is now the Blue Bayou. Right. Um, at, at the Blue Bayou there, Kerner's Resort was at that time. Uh, he went over there and got a little bit out of tune drinking. He got a little bit drunk. And there were some tough guys from Chicago in there, the story goes. And it was a wood stove in there that uh, <laughs> was burning brightly to keep the place warm. And old Abe was in there drinking a little more than he should have. And they were, these two guys, one of them was supposed to, my father called him a pug, which means a boxer from Chicago, a big strong guy from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they were eyeing up Abe, this big guy, like he doesn't look that tough. So they started jawing back and forth in the, in the tavern. It was a tavern at that time. And the fight started. Two of them came after Abe to show him that the city boys were tougher than he was. He got in a fight, I guess he threw the first one right out the door. And the second one, this is the part that's true as I'm sitting here. He, Abe got a hold of the guy that was the fighter, short, squat Irishman, John said he was. And they were slugging it out, and finally Abe had a bear hold on him, and he was just hammered him down, and the guy reached up and bit the end off of Abe's nose. I've seen pictures of him, his nose was sheared right off. Oh. Can you imagine that? And, and people wondered why Abe's end of his nose was gone. He couldn't break loose, so he grabbed him by the nose. And my father would tell stories like that all winter. Oh my gosh. I always wished I had known him for a little while. Uh, my Ollie always tells me she was almost always a little afraid of Abe, because he was a big stern guy and they'd all have supper together on the island and if anybody laughed or giggled at the table of the kids he would scold them and, and let, Ollie said she was afraid to eat some of the time but she was about three or four when she was out there. You know. Now he was a logger, Abe. He was a logger, yeah. He yeah. was. A very he... powerful man. The stories of his strengths, uh, my father I kept telling me things he did that you wouldn't believe a man could do just manually. You know. Big, strong guy, and he, he actually migrated here from Canada way, way back in the 1800s and came in here and staked out all the land, just paid nothing. All he did was drive stakes for a mile, and that was his bond, his squatter's rights from, mm -hmm. historically speaking. You could stake out whatever you wanted, uh -huh. and, yeah. and, and he owned it. In fact, they had to go to court to fight for the island when the state of Wisconsin, they still owned it. and. I went to court because uh, the state wanted to claim it back, 
because all islands were supposed to go back to the state. Uh -huh. And they took them to court and they, they, the state lost it. Some lawyer in, from Eagle River helped my father-in-law uh, maintain ownership of that island. So the Faves Island was privately owned and they were managed to sell it and live on it and do whatever they want. But the state uh -huh. lost that battle, so. And there were three boys from so, Yeah, Charlie, oh, Charlie, Charlie, Frank, and, and John. John. And then Ollie, Lafay, Ollie Sinning, whom my wife is named after, was John's sister. I don't know if you remember, uh, she became, who did she marry? Sundberg. Who is it? Sundberg, is that it? No, this, no, no. this is, um, she, Roy Sinning. Ollie married oh, Roy nice. Sinning, he was a oh. master carpenter, yeah. and he died of cancer in his 40s. And she remarried again, uh, married again, I should say, and uh, lived there and had the choice. They still live there. In fact, families all the way from up in the river through all the, the Fay family, incidentally, is kind of nice. Uh, Susie Bauer, who uh, lives right down on the lake from me, was, uh, came back after a long career of teaching with Jim down in Waniwak, Wisconsin. They settled here. My father-in-law, of course, set them up on a beautiful frontage right down on the lake. His other daughter, Jean, the one who's sadly quite ill right now, um, she, he set up a place and built a home for them right down next to where Jim Bauer is. Now Broadbeck lives right, I don't know if you've seen Al Broadbeck, some man from the city that has it as a summer home. But our family has slowly, is still slowly coming together. I was delighted, for example, to have Susie Bauer and Jim as my neighbors, as well as my brother-in-law and sister, and saw Jack Bauer and his family all grow up up here. And Jack Bauer now lives right across the street from me. And Carrie Bauer, Susie's other daughter, lives right next door to me just recently. Oh, how nice. Came up yeah. here and moved in. And the Frandies are all related to to uh, the Faves. Jim Frandy lives right next door to me on one side, and Jack Bauer on the other side, and Carrie. And now David Frandy, Jim's son, is moved into Ann Sigrid's house across the street from me. And so everyone around me are cousins or relatives of Ollie's, not her side of the family. And I think that's very good. Right now, for example, as I left my yard to come over here for this little talk with you, Carrie's husband, she's the youngest of the, of the, uh, of, of the Bowers' granddaughters. Uh, daughters, not granddaughters. And uh, her husband, big, strong young man named Chris, was out raking my lawn. He said, for you, I'll get the needles picked up for this. how they are, uh, you know, just out there helping me along, knowing that I'm at the point now where I can't do much of that hard work anymore. And, mm -hmm. But it's been a close-knit family, still is. And traces back as far as most of the pioneers around here. It's got, I'm, I always laugh now, I, I think when I spoke to the Historical Society some time ago, mm -hmm. I mentioned to the group, I said, now I've been up here so long that I'm becoming a historical legend. <laughs> some, <laughs> some stories which I shall not discuss. <laughs> Well, you mentioned at one time that um, your father-in-law walked you through the old Buswell community. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be interesting. He, often he would do that. We'd go over to the other side of the lake, too, and he'd say, right here, Forey, he said, I remember when he talked about an Indian tribe that had been there or something like that. Mm -hmm. He showed me where some old loggers had had a cabin, and he took me up to her Buswell and began to tell me about a little town that was there that is absolutely disappeared. It's gone. Mm -hmm. But he said there were people lived there. There was a little school. There was, it was a big sawmill town. I guess is what it was, mm -hmm. and it was aptly named as Buzzwell. <laughs> Sounded like a buzz saw. <laughs> but uh, it was. I can't. It's been so long ago. I can't remember quite where it was. But it was up. I think it was up toward the Mercer. Uh, it was uh, more toward. Uh, uh, Winchester. Oh, the Winchester area. Yeah. That's right. It was over that way. Yeah, we have maps that yeah, actually oh, show know? it. Yeah. But he would tell stories about how uh, that place had its own little school, and and then a fire destroyed it. I, mm -hmm. as, what, as what he told me, there was nothing left of the town, and it just died like that overnight. People had to get out of there and go. And, I think the railroad came in there. The railroad actually came in there, yes. Yeah. And it, it went um, to Boulder, too, didn't it? It did, yep. Yeah. And he, he could take and show me where railroad tracks had been, and 
he'd go and stir around in the woods somewhere and say, right here for you, the place where then he'd tell a story of something that had happened there. Or, and he, he remember he told me that uh, early on, the area over on the other side of the lake um, had such huge pine that the animals kind of stayed out of it. It wasn't bushy or brushy enough for them. And they would try to hunt deer for meat for the winter. And you'd get on the trail, Abel Lefebvre would get on the trail for a, a deer for the winter for food. And he'd go miles and miles and miles, just track it and track it and track it until he finally got it. But it wasn't like standing on the stand now and wait for the deer to come to you. Now they're all over the place up oh, here. But, yeah. but he said they were rare instead of plentiful. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. Because of the, and then the big loggers groups came in on the north side of Island Lake and all around this area and took out logs. And yeah, that's a lot, a lot of history in this town that's uh, old world and interesting and mm -hmm. and I, I'm sort of the tail end of it myself but uh, to listen to stories from uh, John and his brothers that would come up here and some of the old guides I knew very well I knew your dad and uh, Porter Dean over in, in uh, Boulder Junction they were all historic figures and mm -hmm. and I did everything I guided for a while when I was up here well, speaking of guiding, another little, can I tell another quick uh -huh. story? Um, when I first came up here, Ollie and I weren't even married. She took me home to meet her parents. And of course, everyone was dressed like this up here. I thought I got to make an impression. So it was August, hot, and I put on a tweed sport coat, white shirt and tie, nice slacks, my best shoes, and came up here to meet her mother and father. And Susie Bauer was six months old at that time. She had just been born. And everybody was busy with guests. And so I'm standing around waiting to meet her mother. They were too busy to meet their prospective son. Ollie and I were engaged at that time. And I'm waiting to get introduced to the family. And I'm standing there, and Ollie came out and she said, Forey, would you take care of Susie? She said, we're so busy, Mom can't take care. And Susie, I held Susie Bauer, six months old, in my arm, sitting on a swing out in the back of the old main lodge. And here's what's funny. Her dad came walking out of the resort. He'd been busy and there was something. He walked by. He stopped at his tracks. He turned and looked at me. He had a hat on. Nice looking strong man, John Lefebvre. And he kind of looked at me. He saw that I was holding his baby daughter. <laughs> by that time, I imagine people were asking, whose kid is that? And all he isn't even married yet. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sitting there rocking Susie on this way. And he came quietly over and, I, and he said, hello. And he said, and he was looking, at, he knew I was coming to meet the family. Mm -hmm. and so I introduced myself and we had a nice little visit, but imagine me sitting there with a big brown eyed <laughs> Susie baby. <laughs> oh, and oh, we, what we a laughed way. at that story so many times afterward. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, boy. yeah, that, there's a lot of stories. And I hear stories of John's childhood where how, how tough it was for them. Mm -hmm. Things were really tough. They, just like you see some of these. Uh, TV shows about old Alaska where the people are still up in the boonies there. Yeah. You know, I kind of get a kick out of watching some of those old TV skits of... Was his mother from Canada also or did his dad meet somebody here that he uh, met? I have to stop and think about that. She, she was a little short chubby Irish woman. I remember Dolly would describe her to me. Tiny, he was 6'6 six, six, and she was just a tiny little Irish lady. I don't, um, I think she might have come down from Canada too, somehow or other. Huh. Where they met her, how I never did hear that chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder what prompted him to come down from Canada. Uh, I have no idea, but he wandered in and looking for, like a lot of the migrants did, trying to find maybe a little better oh, place sure. to live. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. heard about America and he came across the border. Uh, and ended up right here in Manitowasheri and spent his whole life here. Mm -hmm. But uh, a hard-working family always worked to them. Was, I know when Lafayette retired and, and built that home next door and they had sold the resort, they were so happy because they got going up to Canada a few more trips, which they loved to do. They'd go up there and rent a cabin and catch muskies and my boys and I went up then and then we, when they'd get back, my two sons and I would go up and spend, mm -hmm. uh, Ollie would stay here. A couple of times though, she went up with me too. And uh, then we got to the point where we were really 
uh, important pegs on the board for uh, Lafayette Resort. We worked hard there, and all of my children and Susie Bauer and all of the Lafayette girls, the three of them. You know what's interesting? There's uh, uh, let's see, there's ten years apart in each of the three Lafayette girls. Ollie is 92, Jean is 82, and Susie must be like 72. But their daughters were 10 years apart. Oh, oh wow. yeah. Oh. All very lovely girls, all of them. Did the cabin sell off, or were they torn well, down? Well, the story of that is when they sold it, they sold it to a realtor, um, Newville in Monaco. You may remember Newville, mm -hmm. the realtor. They bought it. Uh, I really want to discuss the price because it was too little. But anyway, it was sold and they were happy to have part of their life without the detail of working a resort. And uh, they built a home, as I said, right next door to me, a nice one, which Jim Frandy lives in now. He bought it. Mm -hmm. Susie Bauer and Jim lived in it for a while. Then they built down on the land on the lake so that the whole family is still clustered mm -hmm. in there. So they, Newville bought the resort and then did they sell the cabins you, off? Or? One summer, everyone was gone. I talked to Mrs. Newville and she said people flocked in to get them. Oh, and they so were in 10 colleges, maybe it was about more than 100 feet apart, a lot yeah. of them, you know, all they did in the old days. And, mm -hmm, yeah. and But they sold like fire. She, she must have had a very good turnover of profit mm -hmm. for the quick sale that she made on that. So they sold, the uh, cottages were sold individually? Yeah. And yeah. then what about the lodge? The lodge is now was uh, bought by this man that lives on the island now. Uh, oh. um, and very good friends of Jim and Susie Bauer, by the way. Uh, the family that lives out there, they've, they've made the island beautiful. It is beautiful, yeah. yes. And they also have done, the lodge was beautiful to begin with, the new one. But they, I've been in it and seen what they've done inside, oh. change things around a little from a commercial look to a, now it's a, they're renting it as a, a get together a lodge mm -hmm. for families to come in. Oh. They call it Bay, Island Bay Lodge. And oh. it, uh, it's beautiful inside. They've still got some of the mementos of uh, the faves in there, it's, you know, historically. There's one of me in there under the, was under the glass plate in the, the, the business desk in the lobby. There was an office where Ollie worked. And there's a picture of me holding a giant muskie that I had caught. I think it was about 35 pounder. That, wow. And I, was, I looked like I weighed about 129 in my bathing suit. The skinny little guy that's great big. <laughs> Speaking of the muskies, I have to tell, is it okay if I tell one more story? Oh, yes. Um, when I first came up here, I don't believe I had ever had the privilege of fishing anywhere. And I, I did, that's all the business up here was love of fishing. So Ali said, well, for you, I'll take you out fishing. So she, we got in a rowboat and we had a couple of spare hours and she was rowing and her dad had given me a black bucktail and a rod and showed me how to throw it. And I was casting it up near the mouth of the Manitowish River. And all of a sudden I thought my arm came loose. And I set the hook and I brought this, I, I was so excited I almost jumped in the water. And I brought this fish in and it was a muskie, my first muskie. And I got it in the boat and it was 29 inches long. Biggest fish I ever saw in my life. Now they use them for bait, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm holding that fish so proud. And Ollie looks at me quietly. She was rowing. She said, Furry, you've got to throw that back. I said, what? You've got to be <laughs> kidding me. It's the biggest fish I've ever had. Weighed about six pounds, I think. And uh, she said, Furry, they have to be 30 inches. And she measured it carefully. And it was flopping around my hands. And also, we're getting cameras out. I got a big fish. And she finally convinced me that I could, it was an illegal fish. <laughs> yeah. and, but I, 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 I knew, though, that the thrill of catching a muskie was one of the main reasons, other than the wonderful Lafayette family, that I stayed here all the years. I, uh -huh. And I learned to love muskie fishing and guided and did some of that, too. So, But that was so funny when she said, you've got to throw it back. I thought oh. we were going to have, have our first real battle. <laughs> Over a fish. <laughs> Over a fish, yeah. Uh, My first muskie. Uh, yeah. So did um, the resort bring guides in for the people who were staying yeah. there? Jake Nelson, our, who was Mrs. Lefebvre's brother, 
a bachelor guy, World War II veteran also, uh, lived right upstairs in the winter house year round. And uh, he guided full time down there. He was excellent, one of the best guides up here. But we, my father also hired guides as he needed them. Uh -huh. okay. He had a Native American guide, uh, Chief something or other, that would come over from Flambeau that everyone liked very much. Chief Dakota? Yeah, Chief Dakota. Uh -huh. He would come over and guide on the faves. And her other uncle, George Nelson, uh, her mother's, it would be her, her mother's brother, Uncle George, would come down from Ironwood and he would guide when it was the busiest and he was a very good fisherman. When he was off, he would always take me out fishing with him in the night. We could only fish late at night because we both all worked all day. And uh, he was he did a lot of guiding. And there were times when they had they had actually in the famous new lodge a guide's dining room, a room just for the guides. Oh, yeah. And I would eat all my meals out there with the guides and they'd come in at noon and or sometimes they had shore dinners of course, but Mrs. Lafay would fix those to take out in the boat. But the guides that stayed there ate right in this nice little dining room of their own and they could swap stories and talk fishing, you know, and stuff. That's mm -hmm. a part of the culture that has disappeared. It has, it really has, Judy, yeah. 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 Now the guides are kind of TV stars, they. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. But they were they were tough guys and knew their business and they rode. Very few of them used any kind of a motor. As the years went on, uh, it was amazing how that changed. I remember I, I used to smoke when I was stupid and young. And when I came here I was smoking a pipe early. I was in my early twenties. And Ollie said, Corey, if you quit smoking I'll buy you an outboard motor. I thought, oh my God, I'd love to have my own outboard motor. And by that time, they had early on five horse Johnsons. And I said, I'll try. A couple of times I I quit at that point, never touched one after that. And we went in and got the motor. She used all her tip money to pay for it, I think, from the lodge. And a couple of times I was going to walk the motor back in and start smoking again when I was. <laughs> but having been in the Navy, I smoked when I was in the Navy. And, but I'm glad I quit that habit yeah. anyway. Yeah. But we did have, I would say there were times we had up to four and five guides at a time working mm -hmm. out there. That's when the big new lodge was there and people would come in, wealthier guests, most of them wealthier, uh, in the lodge and stay American plan all their meals oh, sure. and lived upstairs in deluxe quarters and they'd hire a guide to take them out. We had guests that became almost like family though. You probably remember that, Jody. Some of them would come back year after year. Yeah, Their kids yeah. had grew up and the kids had come. Mm -hmm. There was a family called the Louis who must have spent almost all the while I've been up here, up here. Every summer they'd come and they'd stay all summer. We called it the Louis Cottage because they'd come right around Memorial Day and leave Labor Day. Mm -hmm. And that's nice because you know it meant that they would be like a permanent guest. And mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to be a pain in the neck when they're all that long. But right. <laughs> well, why don't right. my I haven't got enough hangers in my closet. How yeah. come you don't have more hangers in there? <laughs> One guy said to me, <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell you what I told him, but I had to hold my tongue sometimes when I'd, when I'd get a little angry at the guests. One funny story, remember his name, his name was George Strawn. Uh, he came in a little guy with a big mustache and he, he wanted to go musky fishing. So he went out and he caught a small musky, it was legal. But uh, in those days, you were allowed to shoot a muskie. A lot of the guys carried a sidearm, and when they'd bring the muskie along the side, they'd shoot it, and then it would quit flopping around, they'd haul it in. So a lot of the guys carried, Chuck Johnson always carried a sidearm, and, and uh, my Jake and the those guys never did, but <laughs> George Strawn wanted to be power Tony of the West, you know. He had a big pistol on his hip. And I got his boat ready for him, a little 12 foot, nice little 12 foot rowboat. He went out fishing and he did get a muskie on. And he caught, it was a, just a barely legal. He got it in the boat, threw it down on the floor, took the gun and shot the fish in the boat and blew a hole in the well of the boat. <laughs> and he came in and this is what, and I got really mad. He came in and I said, well, how did you do it, George? And he said, I got one for you, look, you got to look. You know, I said, yeah, that's a nice fish. <laughs> and and uh, I said, uh, he hooked the fish and I saw this fresh hole in the bottom of the boat, wood splintered. I said, what did you hit a stump up in the river? No, he said, I shot the fish. He said, you're supposed to shoot the muskie. And I, 
I would, in the water. I, not I, I, had to, I had to really hold my tongue. And I went up and I kind of scolded her. I said, for God's sake, that's, how could you be that stupid or something? <laughs> And, and I hauled the boat up and I had a repair, of course, and I went up and I told my father, I laughed so I thought he'd die. I said, I don't think it's funny. And, and he said, I'll show you how we fixed it for And he cut a cedar plug, big round, shaved it with a knife and got it out there with a hammer and just drove it into the hole uh -huh. and then trimmed it all around and put a little caulking around it and patched the boat. And he was laughing about it. But I was mad because I knew that we had a boat out of commission, you know. <laughs> But the stories go on and on, no joke. I bet yeah. they do, yeah. especially with the, the irritating things that yeah. <laughs> can come up. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful life. So I have not a single regret for having not moved anywhere. In fact, there was a time in my life when I had earned a second master's degree, so I was getting pretty well up in credentials. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I started getting calls from some of the local state universities who wanted me on staff. Stevens Point, really? Stephen University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point offered me a contract in the English department down there. And I, I almost, I thought, gee, you know, the prestige of it, I thought, oh boy. And the salary was somewhat larger than I was making at Lakeland by then. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Rose and Ollie, and she just silently looked at me like, are you really thinking of moving out of here? And, <laughs> and she didn't say a word. She said, it's a choice you have to make for it. And yeah. I, thought, I thought, oh, I could see muskies disappearing. And I, <laughs> I said no. And then I got another uh, offer from uh, Superior University of Wisconsin at Superior, and uh, they wanted me in the uh, the uh, speech and uh, English department up there because I had taken some courses up there in the summer and got to know some of the staff. And, and I turned them down, and I'm glad I did. I stayed right at Lincoln yes. for the full 40 years. Well, as you said earlier, the kids are were like an extended family of yours. Yeah. 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 Now, I know Susie's parents, John and Simon, yeah. are buried in Manitouche yes, Waters. Yeah. Where are Abe Lefebvre and the, his wife buried? Do you know? I honestly don't know, Jody, but I think I saw it was somewhere up in the Ironwood area or something. Oh, maybe, like that. because there were other family yeah, up George there. Yeah, George was up there. Oh, and okay. uh, George and Si's brothers were up there. Uh, John and Syrah are buried there, of course, and Jake is buried there. Jake uh, Nelson, the guy that would be Mrs. Lafay's brother, is buried there. And Ollie and I have two lots there. In, in Manitou Waters. In Manitou Waters, and, yeah. yeah. And yeah. the funny part is it was a gift, a kind of strange gift. Uh, but Mrs. Lafay said, for him, we, uh, we got two lots for you and Ollie. They had bought Sarah's. They thought we might as well get a couple more for you and Ollie, because by then she knew that I wasn't Navy at all at any time. So, so we do have my own property in Manitou Waters. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh, what well, a life. Well, can you think of anything else? Like, I, 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 stories just keep popping up as as we s turn them on and stimulate me a little bit. Like I, I keep thinking of sitting, the happiest days would be in the winter when nothing much to do. And like weekends, I'd be home from school with Golden John's wood shop. He had a nice big wood shop in the yard. Mm -hmm. Fire would be going in the stove and he'd be working on boats and we'd start talking just quietly. And then finally he would uh, come up with, oh, I remember one time when Pa said, and then he would go into a story that was just fascinating to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you know, I was so happy looking at that manual you have of what he wrote. He had beautiful penmanship, by the way. He was mm -hmm. eighth grade graduate as far as he went to school. And uh, he had beautiful penmanship. And he asked me, what do you think about it? you think I should? I said, by all means. I said, some of the stories, just tell them over again and write them. And I proofread a lot of that. I just, I, and I talked to him. I never did, like, correct it or anything like I did with some of your decedents, Jody. That's <laughs> right, nasty notes. <laughs> I still remember one time, one student, you know, my penmanship is atrocious, it is horrible, and Ollie's was beautiful. But I'd write, I'd be grading compositions, and, and in those days there were no computers, it was just handwritten in ink, not pencil. And they'd hand them in, and, and somebody, some guy was a member, uh, had written kind of bad penmanship. 
and uh, I wrote on it. I don't remember what the grade I gave, but I wrote. I always used to write little notes to the kids, like "Good job" or whatever. Uh -huh. And I wrote to them, "You've got to try to improve your penmanship, John." <laughs> and in my handwriting, and he came up to me and he said, "Mr. Johnson, what does this say? <laughs> what does this say?" <laughs> And he was grinny because I had read your penmanship is atrocious to a mother. And, and, and my hand went. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, dear. Uh, they were, well, we had some interesting times at Lakeland High School oh, as well. Oh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. and lots of growth there as well. Oh, there were a lot of stories there, too. That yeah, you saw a lot changing. Yeah. I've had a very interesting life, I can see that. I went through World War II and survived it. Uh, lived through the depression as a little boy. I remember being hungry all the time. I was uh, born in 1925, and you know the big depression was early 30. I remember my mother and dad struggling to get bread and anything on the table. Oh my goodness! And uh, so on. So I, when I went in the navy, I was still thinking, my God, I'm going to have three square meals a day. And the first dentist I ever saw was in the navy, and I still have my teeth. Thank God's because of that. Mm -hmm. They fixed my teeth because I'd never seen it. Then my dad couldn't afford a dentist. Oh. In fact, he was suggesting strongly that I quit high school and help the family by getting a job instead of wasting my time in high school. Uh, oh, but one of my neighbors came over and said, Fritz, he said, you aren't going to let that kid, his name was Jimmy O'Kenny, a neighbor, he said, you're going to let Forrest not finish high school. He said, if, if need be, I'll pay you to let him stay in school. And my dad got kind of mad. <laughs> Yeah. And I did manage to finish and graduated in 1943. Were you an only child? Pardon? Were you an only child? No, one of five. Yeah. I have a brother, a younger brother. One of my brothers and one of my sisters have passed away already, and I'm the oldest of the five. And I have two sisters still living. Mm -hmm. uh, Norma Durst from Minocqua, she taught. Oh, Norma's that's my right. sister, yeah. Yes. Lovely girl. And my sister Nancy uh, is uh, married a second time to a very wealthy man down in Florida. They live on Marco, Marco Island, or the, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, they're the youngest sister, so we had a large family too. But th they grew up later when things were much more prosperous for my dad. He was a salesman for a clothing company, he could, making just poverty wages, you know. And, Mm -hmm. I remember being poor is what I'm trying to say, and as the years went on, I was grateful for everything. The Navy was, but I got good meals and everything taken care of. Mm -hmm. I didn't care if it, we had to shoot somebody to do it. So. <laughs> 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 yeah. But went through the war and came back and found the f nicest family in the world to, to marry into and been there ever since. And. In the summers, too, after the famous Soldier Resort, I thought, what can I do? And among other things, I had full state law enforcement credentials. I don't know if you ever knew that. No. no. Fully, huh? And I thought, well, why, why not? Maybe I'll try it. So I went to the DNR and I became a summer limited term warden. So I, I stayed on the water in summers and made pretty good wages as a, a summertime warden for the DNR. And then oh, as that God. went on, they changed over. And I was totally certified for any police work in any town in Wisconsin, still am. <clears throat> and so finally, uh, the DNR cut way back and being a limited term warden, uh, I, was, I, dis I was dismissed, which was fine. I didn't care. Yeah. It was something to do in the summer because I didn't like to sit around much. Uh, so then I worked for the Woodruff Police Department for 15 years as a patrol officer. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, my. Did not know I that. So know that's, a, that's a chapter that very few people know. The funny part is, another funny story, when I was a police officer, we got a call one night that there were some kids at Crystal Lake Campground that were, they were suspicious of the marijuana beginnings of when marijuana was the deadliest drug in the world. Now everybody's puffing on it. But anyway, uh, we got a call to go in there. So two wardens and I went in there, parked the car out, took off our put on jackets over our uniforms and walked into the park and, and I sat there and there were about 12, 15 young kids, teenagers, maybe 16 to 18, sitting in a fire on the fire smoking and passing a joint from one to the other. And one of the wardens, I forget who it was, said, watch what I'm going to do. And we came and said, hi guys, you having fun? You know, we just pretended we were tourists or whatever. 
And it was a beautiful summer night, <laughs> and these kids are all sitting on stumps around the fire. And this warden, the warden, one of the wardens from Trout Lake, slipped in and sat down with them right on a log, and they're passing the joint along. And finally came to him, and he took it and sat there, and he said, you know what, I got something to tell you guys. He said, you're all under arrest. <laughs> And he pinched a whole bunch of them, and they were crying, and we, we took down all their names and addresses and referred oh. them to their parents, And but that was so funny, he sat God. there right in the circle, we're standing waiting for this to explode. <laughs> was they shocked, they thought they had a good, happy, older guy that was like, joining them on a joint, you know? <laughs> now, were you teaching at that time? Yeah, I was teaching, but working summers with the police, yeah. So you didn't uh, know these kids? No, I didn't know them. They were from, out of the, most of them were campers' kids. That, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, well, so you could, hmm? Go ahead. I was going to change the subject. Uh. Um, so you got to know the kids pretty good. Oh, yes. Especially from town here. You, you knew Frankie? Oh, Frankie. Uh, he, was, he was one of my favorites because he was a shy, nice young man. And this and is Frankie? very much uh, introverted when he was even in high school. He, he yeah. was part of the gang, though, Ricky Bach and then that whole gang from up here kind of stuck mm -hmm. together. But Frankie was kind of a, uh, a little bit afraid of things for whatever reason. I know, but I sensed that he was in my class. Yeah. After he passed away, Betty Kohler came over to my house one day. She said, you know, Fari, she said, uh, uh, I've still got a theme he wrote in your English class. And she said one of the proudest moments of his life was when he had, she said, I, I've got it. And she brought me, showed me one of the compositions he had written in, I think it was junior English class. It was a good piece of writing. I used to help him find a theme to write on, something you like, something you do. And he wrote about fishing and he told a story about an exciting fishing venture. And uh, I had helped him organize this paragraphs and ideas so that they would blend. And he did a really nice job, and I gave him a B plus on it. Oh. And he was a, he was an average, good, hard working student, but I gave him a B plus, and he was so proud of it. I wrote him a note, Frankie, this is excellent. Keep up, you know, some complimentary work. And uh, he brought it home, showed it to his mother, and and he said she said he was so proud of that thing. So that's the story of Fourier and his glory, or Jack and his glory. <laughs> <laughs> but another part of my life, I don't hate to bore you with him, but I was a pretty darn good professional musician for a long time. Too. Really? Oh, yeah. Played drums. I was a, in fact, uh, when the kids come, you know, all my kids are musical. When we come, they'll be home next summer. If you can get over there, you'll hear a five-piece band that you never heard before, and I still play the drums. I had actually started when I was in high school playing with some of the small bands up in Iron Mountain. And uh, then, of course, the war interrupted that and teaching. But um, as, when I got into college, I joined a band of veterans, a bunch of veterans mm -hmm. that were musicians got together. And we made pretty good money at our weekends. And without interrupting our studies, we worked and, huh. and so on. I remember um, in high school, uh, one at least one, if not more, um, homecoming. Oh, yeah. And you and some of the other teachers, um, we thought it was just hilarious that you were trying to play mu our music. You oh, know? yeah. You got, yeah. Oh, was, it was like a skit. I yeah. was fate, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who, who, was, who was it? That was you and... and Gene Arnold, probably. Gene Arnold yeah. and... And uh, we had a couple of teachers that had... It wasn't played. Roger Roper. No, I don't think so. But maybe one of the math teachers or something? I can't remember. There were like f uh, three to five. Yeah. I know for sure three. But I actually, uh, when Norma Roosh would have her uh, Latino Fiesta uh, show, the auditorium would be packed there, and she asked me to play the drums with her on the piano for the musical. Cause she did a lot of, dan had oh, a lot right, of dancing. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I sat and played the drums with Norma. Norma is a very talented a pianist as well. She's very dancer, talented too, yeah. many things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, she isn't she an Oxley? No, no. she was a Derubis. Derubis, okay. yeah, from a Okay, right. So much music in your family as well as Ollie's family. 
The what? Music in both your family. Yeah, both. I mean, both sides yeah. of your. Oh, Ollie was a magnificent pianist. She played the Northern Michigan Symphony Orchestra. I still remember we were married. I was going with her up there then. And I'd sit in the audience and watch her. And she was sitting behind this monstrous grand piano with about a hundred piece orchestra. And she looked so tiny there. You know, she's a little <laughs> tiny girl. And she'd be up to her feet hardly reach the pedals. And she'd be playing this great big grand piano. Yeah, she taught piano for a while here. She taught me to play piano. Oh, did she really? She used know? to come to our house. Oh, my And God. then until she uh, was pregnant with Mike. Oh, be darn. I remember she quit and she yeah. told my mother, I said, I'm, you know, I'm pregnant. And yeah. so I'm not going to, because she would drive around. She'd come, yeah. come to the house to give, give yes. me lessons. Sure. And she yeah. was also modest, you know. She, she wasn't one that would play, like, for if people would come, she'd stop playing. She just... And she was magnificent piano scene. She could sit down and play almost mm. anything, classical or jazz or, mm. yeah, the, the whole family of uh, 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 musicians. Mm. And L Linda has a beautiful voice. My daughter Linda that lives right over here in Manitou's Lake, she she's plays guitar a little bit for mm. fun. I didn't know she sang. Yeah, mm. Linda, Linda's got a big, lovely voice. Susie sang in the church school choir and, and Lisa, 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 Lisa teaches music yet. Yeah. She's teaching voice and piano down in Ann Arbor area there. Oh. Yeah. She's got her own studio. Oh great. Yeah, so yours have been interesting for me. Yeah. 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 Well was there anything else that we should add or I hope I made some sense to all of my ramblings here. You oh, it was have. wonderful. Oh, thank wonderful. you. I'm glad to you enjoy, had enjoy talking with you guys. Uh, 